Hello out there world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are around the seven continents. And today we have an awesome guest, former Olympic gold medalist, David Smith, an all-around athlete. How are you doing, David? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everyone, or good evening, exactly like you say, uh, wherever, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm great. I can't complain. I've just come in from a 30-minute a interval session in London in the rain, but it was, you know, it was just beautiful to be out moving the body and you know, sort of getting the mind into flow and, and, you know, the bodies are built to move. And, you know, I love getting out in the morning, sort of first thing early and, and doing my training sessions and just waking up the body and, and getting that mental clarity first thing in the morning, I think is so important for the rest of the day. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Man, D David, I, I want to let you know um, in front of everybody that I really appreciate the support you've given the platform over the last few months. You know, that's how I found you. And, um, but more importantly, I just want to say thank you be, uh, to the way that you've handled yourself in your life, because I'm just going to read a small definition out here for the audience. Psychological resilience is the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with a crisis or to return to a pre-crisis status quickly. And basically that's just fancy for saying getting up one more time than you were knocked down and it's not always in the physical sense it's in the mental sense depending on what happens um to you in your life and and in this case we're talking about your life today david um and i don't and you know you say you started your morning off doing some exercise getting that mental component in um but i'm going to ask you some tough questions here today david and um, if at any moment you don't feel comfortable answering it, it's okay. But I just want to let you know I appreciate you so much for being on this podcast. So, are you ready? Yeah, I'm all good. I'm sorry there. I just I don't know what happened. This is a good definition of resilience. My phone <laughs> dropped out of the uh, out of the, out of the eye out of the tripod. So I'm just with oh, one no. arm getting <laughs> back in. Oh no, please don't worry, man. And and while you handle that, um, you know, just just know and for the audience out there. Uh, David is the reason why I read the little definition of resiliency is because David has faced um, some difficult moments in his life that many of us would have probably re retracted back into maybe a, a freeze mode or survival instinct or um, have probably given up and set limits for himself. But David, every time he was faced with a barrier let's say he was able not only to stand up but he was able to push that barrier forward and he kept defying the limits and we'll start off with early on in your life david i was reading that which is how you know i i was marveled at your story you were born with a club foot and that was immediately early on in your between i think from birth to three years old i'm not sure when but do you mind talking a little bit about that yeah, sure. So I, I was born with a condition called talipasis, which is club foot. And uh, up until the age of three, I'd suffered uh, uh, tremendous amounts of trauma, tremendous amounts of stress. I, I obviously can't remember this consciously, but I, I guess those unconscious programs were being very much hardwired and written early on with, with the effects to, of trauma. But uh, I went through no surgeries, but my, my feet were sort of repeatedly broken and reset into special plaster casts and boots. And I learned to walk in, in these special plaster casts. And I think the, the earliest memory of my, my parents sharing this with me was that the one night the doctors had said, you know, don't take the boots off. If you take the boots off, there's a high chance that you'll lose your legs. And at sort of two, three o'clock in the morning, I was screaming, I was in lots of pain as a baby. And my dad, you know, decided, look, we're, we're gonna take these boots off. And when he took them off against medical advice, my legs were black from the knees down. So if I actually, if they'd followed medical advice at night, I would have been a double amputee from the, from the knee down. Uh, so that, that was a huge amount of trauma to go through as, as a young baby. But actually at the same time as being born with the, with the club foot, I was also born with a, a very rare genetic tumor that rested inside the spinal cord in my neck. And that caused uh, two or three convulsions as a baby where I actually stopped breathing in my sleep and was rushed to hospital. And at that point, they didn't find the tumor. They wouldn't find the tumor until 32 years later. 
But what they did do is they misdiagnosed me with epilepsy and they, they stuck me on Tegretol medication for the best part of 10 to 12 years, which also has a, a huge effect on your, on, you know, on your mindset and your psychology. There's a lot of uh, conditions that are related to Tegretol medication. So yeah, for, for my huge part of my childhood, I, I, was, I believed I had epilepsy, but I actually didn't. Um, and also I had these occasions where I'd stopped breathing and had convulsions in my sleep, plus the, the club foot. So I think very early on in my life, I was being, I was being tested, but uh, ultimately con- conditioned as well to, to become a pretty uh, resilient human. You, you, you know, you mentioned how um, you were misdiagnosed early on with epilepsy when really was a tumor in, in, um, in your kind of like your spinal area, your neck area. and the doctors told you even before that with the club foot, don't take it out. And one night you were hurting so much and your dad said, no, we're, we're taking this off. And it was pretty bad. And so immediately we're talking about two mis- two mistakes that happened throughout the process in the medical industry. And you weren't really um, uh, old enough to be aware of these things. Mm-hmm. But the... What what effect do you think that had on your parents? And obviously, you were able to springboard um, from this as we're going to move along. But what effect do you mm-hmm. think early, right, right earlier on, this had on your parents and your family? Because obviously, they cared about you. I, I think it probably had a huge impact, and, and I think we you know, were going back to the late seventies, early eighties, and there wasn't the tremendous amounts of knowledge accessible to people that there is today. And, you know, certainly around psychology and, and mental performance, the, this sort of stuff it existed, but it was, it was very niche. And uh, my mum was a hairdresser and my dad was an electrician. So they, they had gone very much into survival mode, you know, fight, flight mode. I would say that for sure their limbic system was definitely running and overpowering their, their sort of uh, prefrontal cortex and their, their, emo- their consciousness. So they were... You know, they were very highly stressed. It, it caused a lot of tension um, between medical experts and also themselves, you know. So in a very, I guess, in a lot of ways, a bit of a hostile environment. So, um, and obviously as a, as a baby, you're not very conscious of what's happening, but you're certainly taking everything in. And, and that, I guess, in a lot of ways, that's sort of developing your, your, your mind for how you're going to deal with life in, you know, future, future episodes in life. Well, little did anybody know at that moment that those events, whether how conscious about it you were or not, were were going to be almost um, a representation of what was going to happen moving forward. And and I mean that in a in a positive light because mm-hmm. you were able to springboard yourself off uh, from that situation and with the support of your family, continue to move forward in what you wanted to do. And very early on. You got interested in karate. If I'm not mistaken, you know, I, I tried piecing together the timelines yeah. from everything I read. Yeah. But do you want to share how that was from springboarding yourself off from what was happening immediately early on and, and believing that you have epilepsy to going into karate? How was that? Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, I grew up in the highlands of Scotland and there's a little ski village called Abbey Moor. And um, it, it's, it's produced many, many Olympians over the years. And I think for me, I wasn't really at that point interested in education. I, I just thrived in, in sport. I loved it, whether it was skiing, water skiing. We have a sport there called Shinty, which is, a, is like a Gaelic sort of ice hockey on grass type sport. And I, any sport that was there, I just, I just went to and, I, and I loved it. And I, I think my mum recognized very early on that there was sort of two ways that I was going to go. I was either going to hang out with the, the guys who weren't doing very much and possibly get into trouble with the police or I was going to go down the sporting route. I was not, at that point, very academic. So she just took me to every sports club there was. And I think what that did is it, it really it gave me values. It, it taught me values such as persistence, resilience, courage, respect, uh, discipline. So I was getting subconsciously exposed to all these values that sport was offering. And then there was a local karate club started. And I just remember hassling my mum as a seven-year-old going, you know, I want to go to karate. I want to go to karate. <laughs> this so my mum took me along and I think at that point you know I I basically grew up as a sing in a single parent household because my dad worked away the the karate instructor became you know what was great about karate is you have a sensei sensei and a set you're the senpai so anyone that's older you're a higher grade as your sensei 
So automatically it teaches you this respect that you have for, for, for people above you who know more than you. So you automatically, as a young kid, you've already got mentors. So you're, it's a role model, you're, you're mirroring the behavior. And, and I just fell in love with, with karate more so because it was a test of mind, it was a test of body, but it, at that time, it wasn't so much a sport, it was more of an art. So you were becoming a student of, of, of life at a young age. And I think what was really great with karate, and I always say that karate is what's kept me alive through six spinal operations and tumor diagnoses, is because what it ultimately taught me to do is it, it, it did one huge thing, it taught me how to breathe, so I, you know, we'd start every session with a meditation. We'd do our, our karate training. At the end of every session, we would meditate to bring stimulate the parasympathetic system. I wasn't aware of this as a seven-year-old, yeah. um, but, but I was getting exposed to this environment. And it was very strict. It was very disciplined. And I just fell in love with it. I loved it. I loved every aspect of about it. It wasn't about fighting. It was about learning and studying an art and trying to master it. And you could never be perfect. You never got the perfect form, the perfect kata, the perfect moves, because you were always striving to get to that next level. And, and I just fell in love with that. And I fell in love with the history of it all. And ultimately, I mean, I, I, I started karate at seven and I probably, I think I, I trained all the way through to about the age of 20. So it was a, it was a big foundation of, of, of my of my life not just in a sporting context but in just generally becoming the human I am today I love how you said that karate for you wasn't about fighting that they really focused on the other aspects of karate which is uh, that oftentimes people miss such as the values the way you set yourself up you push the limits of your body but it's always in in a matter of respect to continue moving forward and to be better um, and, and there's a lot of respect involved in that. And I, I could already see um, how it wasn't just you being mentally strong and being able to get up one more time. It's also the way that you uh, see the events that happen in your life in a certain perspective that you have no other option but to move forward because you're so grateful for the opportunities presented in front of you, David. And honestly, that's, um, that's something that we can all take with us. How... You know, throughout this time, um, I know that you went from karate to sprinting, but were you still having health issues around the same time where you started karate to seven and moving forward? Yeah, so not so much in, in the early years. Um, the, the, the real major tumor symptoms probably happened around about the age of 17, 18. And this is, this is maybe a little bit of the paradox with karate because I don't, I'll never forget a session in Aberdeen. I, was, I trained in Aberdeen in a place in Scotland in a, in a pretty rough council estate. And I remember going over one day and the very first fight I was in, I got knocked out. I got punched in the face, broken nose, lying on the floor, came round and my nose was bleeding. And the sensei that day basically put two bits of tissue up my nose and told me to get on the mat and fight again. And I was only 15 year old and I was fighting a 30 year old adult. And that day, being able to get back off the ground with the tissue up my nose to stop the blood, two black eyes, and to go back and fight again. That there, that gave me probably every resilience lesson I needed to deal with anything else later in life. So when I was getting knocked down with any health issue, I automatically took my mind back to the dojo in that session. And I thought, okay, if I can get up now, this has defined me as a human being from being on the, on, on the floor to be able to stand up, to go back in. So it taught me how to deal with fear. It gave me the courage to, to, to how to perceive a situation rather than seeing it as a threat, to see it as a challenge and an opportunity. So I guess in some ways with a paradox with that is when I started to have a lot of health issues, I would just kind of almost subconsciously kind of block them and say, well, you know, I, I don't need to deal with this. It's, I'll, I'll just go and do sport. So sport became a, a relationship that it was almost, I guess in a lot of ways, because I was getting into flow at a young age, I was getting these rushes of all these neurotransmitters. So I was basically getting like this, I was like a chemical factory in my brain. I was getting exposed to dopamine, serotonin, you know, norepinephrine, all this. At such a young age, sport became almost an addiction. So it wasn't about trying to win medals or anything. It was just about how far can I push? How far can I take my body and my mind? I love it inside myself 
So when I started to get symptoms for the tumor, around about 17 or 18, I started to suffer real pain, urine problems, sexual function problems, bowel problems. I just went and trained harder. And the more symptoms I got, the harder I trained because I almost used sport as a place to, to, to hide because obviously I'm getting these rushes from all these neurochemicals that I felt great there. But then when I went to try and address any of the symptoms, that was a place I didn't want to be. So I, I kind of, it was during my time in athletics, I went from karate to athletics and it was during my time running as a, as a 400 meter runner that I started to really, you know, suffer from the, the symptoms of the tumor originally but you know doctors misdiagnosed it again they said you know you're doing too much sport that, that was what they told me and you, wow um i'm sorry there's there's just so <laughs> much that you gave there and 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 it, it the the part that's uh that marvels me is that you say the more symptoms you were getting the harder you would train and and maybe at the moment you weren't realizing because you were using the training as a coping strategy for you to get yeah. your mind off everything, to push your body, to create this chemical factory, as you said, in your body. But you wanted more. And, and um, <laughs> without you realizing, you created a, um, a resilient individual, which you are. And you went from karate to sprinting. And obviously, David, I could be wrong because this is stuff I was reading. Uh, because you wanted to compete in the Olympics. Now, I know, I believe, um, I could be mistaken that in today they have karate in the Olympics. But they back do. then, they do, right? They, but yeah, back then, they do, they do now. Yeah, <laughs> but, back, but back then they didn't. And, they, I, and I guess, you know, growing up in Aviemore, all of my, you know, my, my best friends, Noel Baxter and Alan Baxter, and then there's guys, Andrew Fresh works online. Oh, there's a whole, I can list 30 names that went to the Olympics. And of course, I'm watching this. And I'm looking, thinking, well, I, I'm in the, I'm competing in karate, but uh, these guys are doing something that's a, another world, and I like, I want to be part of that. And you know, I thought, okay, athletics is a way that I can do that. And and there's one thing I've all, I always apply myself and train hard. And what I realized with athletics and in sport in general, if you've got the right genetics and you, you put in the work and you, you know, you're focused and you're determined and you have these values that you usually get, you'll get a result back. And what I realized is that I was putting in all the work and all the effort and nothing was really coming back. And I think what the biggest problem I had is that the, the tumor I had is inside the spinal cord. So it's actually wrapped and interpressing on the nerves. So of course, everything in your body is regulated by the autonomic nervous system and my central nervous system is compromised. So as I'm asking my body to try and not just perform, but also to recover. And that's the thing with sport. You need to perform at a world-class level, but you need to recover at a world-class level. But if you've got a compromised central nervous system, that's not going to happen. And of course, I, I didn't know that in, in, all the way through my whole sporting career until the age of 32. So in this early time, I was suffering from all of these issues that looked like overtraining. And of course, because I was doing lots of training as a, as a form, almost as a coping strategy, like you say, then I just thought I was overtraining and doing too much. Little did I know that I had a, I had a tumor that was basically slowly killing me, uh, growing inside me. You know, that, that, story, that story, that part about the mixed diagnosis, very unfortunate. And immediately, sometimes people want to blame the medical industry and blame this, but, at, but maybe at those times, the doctors were doing the best they can. Or, or, you know, I wasn't there for that situation, but... Once you started sprinting and you kept pushing yourself and pushing yourself, what happened that that's when that's when the they realized, hey, this is a tumor. So it was actually a little bit later on. So um, I'd sprinted for several years. I'd had all the issues with the tumor. I'd gone through different roles within sport. I, I'd actually moved into coaching. And I was, it was whilst I was working with the British ski team as a coach, and I had a physio session. And I was down in a physios in, in a place in Scotland, and the physio then actually encouraged me to to go into a, into rowing, into Paralympic sport, and have have a little look at a different avenue. And it was actually I, I transferred from, so I kind of went from the sprinting into the ski coaching, and then into rowing. And it's when I went to rowing, we we because it's a real power endurance sport. The sessions were were very intense. And I was probably six months into being on the British rowing team and I started to have extreme neck pain. I was having shooting pains through my wrist, back pain. 
I was having like seizures in my sleep and I was waking up and I couldn't move. I couldn't even walk. And the whole time you're sort of getting monitored. And at the same time, I'm also going to my NHS doctor to ask, you know, look, I'm having these things going wrong with my body. This is not natural. And eventually it was like all the pieces of a jigsaw were just starting to come together over, over 10, 15 years. And eventually I uh, was, was sent for an MRI scan in 2010. And I went in for the scan and, and that's basically, I guess in a lot of ways, that's when my life really changed because that was the first diagnosis. It was in a little village called Weybridge, which is sort of 40 minutes outside of London. I walked in, the neuroscientist was sat there and he basically held up a scan and he just said, see this shaded area, that's a tumor. And it's so interesting when, you, when you're told that, the, the, it's such a huge thing. It's like almost being hit by a, by, a, by a train or a bus. It's so big that you, you go straight into the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. So you go straight to denial. And it's almost like you don't kind of hear it. It's really weird. And I was like, me? Tumor? Like, what? And I kind of just said, can I still go to training? the Olympics are in two years time. I don't really have time for a tumor. Um, I can't miss training. And, and I left that meeting completely in shock. And it took me probably 48 hours to absorb what I'd been told. And then from the moment, the moment I absorbed it to then be sitting in front of a neurosurgeon telling me that he was going to cut my neck open here he was going to go through, perform a laminectomy through the vertebrae to cut into the spinal cord, to open the spinal cord, to remove the tumor. Life that week was, was insane. Because uh, one minute you're training in a high-performance Olympic setup, your only pure focus is all about performance, and then the next minute you're being told that you might die. And you're looking in the mirror, and what you're seeing in the mirror is not what you're seeing on the scan. So that puts you into a, into a huge emotional cascade of, 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 uh, of, of psychological stress, of emotional stress. Everyone around you is falling apart, your mum, your dad. So you're trying to like hold these people up and at the same time you're trying to, to fathom out what's, what's, how are you going to deal with it. And the thing is with cancer and tumours, there's, there's no right and wrong. Everybody is very, very different. And the language you use around it can be very sensitive to certain people. For me, as an athlete, I seen it as a fight. That was my perception. I thought this is like being on the, in the mat, on the karate dojo. This is my opponent. And it's like chess. It's a strategy behind it. How, how am I going to deal with it? So I, I moved into very much karate mode mindset. Now, that wouldn't work for everyone, but it, it worked for me. And, that, and that's how I approached it. But um, yeah, from the minute of being diagnosed to the sitting with that surgeon was, uh, yeah, that, that week was a, was a pretty, pretty horrendous week. You, uh, you know, I appreciate you so much for opening up about this. And I can tell that, you know, even I feel a certain way from when you tell me that because I, I, feel, I feel it inside of some of the stuff you had to go through. And I really mean that, David. And, you know, that you mentioned earlier how the Karate was a place for you, you know, no matter what happened, you wanted to keep pushing forward. And um, that type of mentality, it seems to transferred throughout your whole life up to this point, because even when you were diagnosed with, with um, the tumor and, and, the, and you were in the, the, hot, in the doctor's room and, and you're like, oh, me? Well, can I go to training the next day? That mentality of, okay, this is how I'm going to escape, it continued to go. And... Um, and it's just, it just, it just brings cheers to me in that, in that sense, because it's a motivation for me. And I'm sure for everybody listening to this podcast on how don't, don't stop and keep pushing and keep pushing. I mean, you went from being torn from with a club foot, uh, being misdiagnosed with epilepsy, being in karate, continuing to push through, going to sprinting, then going to rowing. And it's almost like every time someone puts a freaking wall in front of you, you, you just climb over it. And um, that's so amazing. And, and if I'm not mistaken, David, from that surgery in 2010, that sounds like it was really tough, but you went through it. 
and you were paralyzed after the surgery. And what was the expectations at that moment? Yeah, so, so the first surgery I went through, the, you know, they removed it, you, you wake up in ICU. It's, it's a pretty traumatic experience when we're coming around from anesthetic. You have, you know, tubes coming out you, there's blood things, there's, there's, there's the beeping. It's, it's a pretty, uh, it's a very traumatic experience. Um, so I recovered, uh, the hospital sent me home after about five, six days. And then when I was at home, I actually had a spinal stroke. So I had a blood clot form where they'd done the surgery and I was slowly becoming paralyzed from the neck down and my eyes were rolling in my head and I was, I was basically fine for my life. And um, I didn't really want to make a huge fuss of it. So we didn't phone an ambulance. I phoned a mate. My mate drove around to my house to one look at me and was like, wow, we need to get you to hospital. So between my friend and my mum, they sort of bundled me into his car and we drove, which was 50 minute drive to the hospital. We arrived at the hospital. They, they, I vaguely remember being put in a wheelchair. And by this time, I'd lost all function of my body. I, could barely, I couldn't even talk. And I was rushed in. I was then basically put into, onto a drip. They stabilized my, my uh, spine. I was rushed into the MRI machine, told that look, you're having a spinal stroke. I had no idea the severity of a spinal stroke. And then I was taken in for surgery, an emergency surgery to decompress my spinal cord and ultimately to save my life. And then when I woke up from that, I had like what was, it's like a temporary paralysis. So I couldn't, I could move, but I couldn't, re, I couldn't stand, I couldn't function. And I, and I lay in bed for a month. And this was, this was when I really started, I guess, my psychology journey of, of how powerful the mind is because we're two years away from the Olympics. We're, we're uh, 14 months away from the world championships. And I, was, I started to rebuild my body using my mind. I basically used a lot of imagery work, a lot of visualization work. I, I would visualize my limbs moving. I would pull on past memories from sport. I would look at future events and basically try. And I, and I used to work probably doing the visualization imagery work I would do for maybe like you know, eight, nine hours a day. Uh, and, and that, and I, I believed in it, I invested in it. And within six months of that surgery, I was back in a rowing boat rowing. And within 14 months, I was a world champion. And then within two months, two years, I, I crossed the line at the, the London games for a gold medal. So that within the two years of going from being diagnosed, having two surgeries, one for a spinal stroke, one for the tumor, temporary paralysis through all of the rehabilitation which was a really dark place to then sat on the start line in, in a home games was it was such a roller coaster of events and um and I, I guess I never really had time to stop and reflect on the on the magnitude of what had happened and I guess at that point when you when you have a when a tumor you always go to oncology you have scans every five months and scans every six months or, and I was getting scans every six months and they were like, okay, everything looks okay. And I never really thought it would ever happen again. But I remember saying to myself, after I sort of stood on the podium, had the gold medal, I sat down in a boathouse just on my own to get a little bit of peace and quiet. And I just thought, wow, you know what? I could never go through this again. This has been horrendous. And little did I know that I was about to be re-diagnosed. But um, when I, when I finished there, I thought, you know, that's it with Rowan. I want to close the door on the Rowan, the Rowan world because it had so much emotional memories of trauma because of the, the diagnoses. The, everything was like a memory. Everything triggered this memory of, 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 of tumors. So uh, I left Rowan and uh, I, I, I found a bicycle and, and I joined the, the British cycling team on the development program and everything was going great. And then uh, unfortunately the, the scan in 2014 uh, showed that the tumor had come back. So four years on from the first diagnosis, I was, I was faced with uh, having to, to, go, to go through it again. And, and the first time is really alarming. And the, but when you have a second time, there's a, there's a benefit and a, and a, and a, and a negative. The, ne the negative is, is that you know what's coming. And you know it's not going to be nice. And uh, the positive is you also know what's coming. So you can create a plan. You can have a strategy of the things that worked before, the things that didn't work. So you're not going in blind, but you're, you know what's coming. You know the pain. You know everything that's coming ahead of you. So again, it, it, was, it was a pretty traumatic experience to, to, to basically 
give yourself up. You have to, it's a, it's a conscious decision. You know, you're, you're told, okay, your tumors come back. This time we're going to have to cut you down the back of the neck. There's a one in 500 chance that you'll be paralyzed from the neck down. You might die. They give you all these things. You sign the forms and your whole fight or flight system is going crazy. You're wanting to get on a plane and just run away. But actually you have to walk to the anesthetic room. And I remember going in and walking to the anesthetic room you know, you climb onto the anesthetic bed, you've got your gown on, your hospital socks, and, and you know, everyone's speaking around you, there's lots of noises they're putting tubes into and lines into, and you sort of, for me personally, I paused and I looked around the room and I was thinking, wow, if it, what if this is the last thing I ever see? What if I don't survive this? And then quickly I'm like, well, you can't think like that. And it would be really interesting to get your idea on this because I've always believed that when you go into surgery and when you go into anesthetic, okay, you're consciously maybe not aware of you being cut open and because you're under anesthetic, but your mind on a subconscious level must know that something's happening. So I quickly realized that actually I, I need to meditate. I did my breathing and then before I knew it, I was uh, unconscious and then I, I woke up uh, six, seven hours later with a very sore head and pain where they'd cut me right down the back of my neck to remove the tumor for a second time well that's um you know it's a lot of people don't realize it but intelligence goes well beyond our conscious state of mind i mean for example i don't remember my great 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 grandmother i never met her i don't i i never seen a picture of her but her nose is on my face and so our memory isn't just conscious, it's, it's so ingrained in us in every single cell in our body. And the moment that you have a thought and you're focusing on, not maybe having a thought, but you're focusing on that thought and your attention goes into it, there's a whole chemistry in the body on a, on a microscopic level that changes. And yes, you, they may have hit you with the anesthesia, but your body knew that you were going into the surgery. And once they cut you open, um, the drugs took its effect. It did numb sections of your body, but your body knew how to react. And it's almost like because it happened the first time, who knows how your body reacted at that moment if it mm -hmm. let them in. And it obviously um, did its wonders with you, David. And, and honestly, man, I, let me tell you, congratulations on that gold medal. Because if there's anybody that deserved it, it was you, man. And, um, you know, to be next to paralyzed in 2010 with 14 months away from the gold and you using literally guided imagery techniques and people laugh at these things but you're a living example of it because there's been so many studies shown how guided imagery is uh is just as good as physical practice if i were to sit here for a week and in my mind for about an hour or two picture myself shooting hoops it's just as good literally just as good as if I was there shooting hoops in person and it's almost like you were doing double the work and you were pushing yourself forward but I know um, as well that your family had a huge part in this process um, you know what what how did your social support system help you to elevate yourself and uh, what did they mean to you throughout this process? Um, and you being an Olympic gold medalist, and even after picking up another sport in bike and um, cycling, excuse me, and you and I do see you on your Instagram profile cycling to London. So what what has your social support system meant for you in this process, and um, and how have they helped you? Yeah, you know that that's a, it's a really good question. It's it's been it's been extremely important because there's you know in in sport they always talk about the team behind the team. So you can never any Olympic gold medalist you see or world champion they don't do it on their own. There's a huge team of people behind from psychology to nutrition to strength and conditioning to coaches, physiology. There's all these people, so it's hugely hugely important. And then also you you have your friends and your family and these people are very very important. I'm to, I'm. I guess I'm naturally more introverted, um, but even even as an introvert, I still need social connections. I still need these people around me. And certainly every time I've been diagnosed, once I've processed it on an internal level myself, the first thing I do is I reach out to my friends. I reach out to, to, to my close friends. I know that I, I you know, I, I, I'm emotionally intelligent enough now that I know each friend that can handle each thing. So if I need a lot of empathy, I know who to go to. 
if I need someone to tell me, you know what, you need to get out of that bed and you need to smash it, I know which friend to go to. So, and I've really narrowed that down to a very small group of people. And I, I didn't want to spread myself wide. You know, when, after an Olympic Games, you, you have all these people that want to be your friend. And, you know, I always, I know who came to visit me in hospital. And I, and a lot of times I skim over the medal. The medal's not really important to me. I don't really, I, I'd say, I, to use the word I don't care for, it's not the right word, but I guess my philosophy for life has changed where my philosophy for life back then was about winning. Actually, my philosophy for life now is about being where my feet are, being present and trying to, to inspire other people to live a more purposeful life. So that doesn't really need to be done with winning. It's more about living by my values. And that's also reflected with the friends I have and the network I have around me, that these are people who are, they're all driven, they're all successful, but they're successful because they're living by their values. And, that, and that's how I'm measuring their success. So I, I try to keep this positive group of people around me. And, I, and I'm very aware of the, the fault finders and the merit finders. And I, and I try to always strive to be a merit finder and keep people around me who are the same. And, and, and that ultimately won't pull you down. And it's very easy when you're diagnosed, certainly for the second time, and I had to go through it the second time before going into that surgery, I made sure that I had all the people in place that I knew I was going to need uh, over the next sort of six months of, of training. And I, and I remember waking up again. And after that second surgery, I think it was only, I was back on a bike within three months. And I remember going to Spain with, with my best friend, Noel Baxter, in a training camp. And he was hard on me. He was like, come on, you need to get out on the bike. And, and he would leave me. <laughs> and anyone from the outside looking in might be thinking, that's terrible. You can't, that guy's just come out of surgery. But I needed that. I needed him to push me. And my rowing coach did the same thing. My very first training session back in rowing after the double surgery, she said, okay, you've got to get on the rowing machine and row 18 kilometers in the boathouse with no music, just looking at a boat. And she goes, if you go home before you finish the session, you're done. And a lot of people might be, oh, you can't, that's that, you can't be doing that. This guy's just come out of hospital. But again, I, I needed that because I want, part of my philosophy is to, to really push my body and mind at the highest level. So I need people around me who are going to push me. But then I also need the people who are empathetic, who can sort of give me a cuddle and say, you know what, I understand. Um, and, that, and that's been crucial throughout every diagnosis and, and every surgery. And I, you know, I'm on to my sixth surgery now. I've been diagnosed four times and had six spinal surgeries in 10 years and, and seven weeks of radiation. So during that process, I've had, there's no way I could have done it on my own. But I think it was very important to know who I can tell things to. And there's certain friends who can't deal with it. There's, there's certain friends who just they just can't deal with it it's too overwhelming for them so i i try not to really delve into the real emotional part of that and i think what's hard sometimes is i'm a really positive person and i think it's recognizing that even positive people have negative days <laughs> and, yes. and, and actually that's okay but if i'm having a bad day it's funny watching some of the people in my network they fall apart because they can't handle me having a bad day Wait, um, you're a role model and I love how you say that you, you, you talk to certain friends um, when you need um, like a certain feeling. If you, if you just want to let out the emotion, you know what friend to talk to. If you want someone to push you, you know what friend you're going to call. And I love that because you're using your network the way it's supposed to be used. Yeah. And in turn, they lean on you. And I can see now um, from my question earlier how your social support system plays such a huge role because they were giving back to you what you were giving to them. And yeah, it was definitely, told, it was a two, it was a two way thing. Yeah. And the, and in them watching you succeed, it almost pushes them to be more better. And um, I hope that in this podcast today, when people listen to it, they can see how uh, there's always going to be setbacks. And there's a lot of times life isn't fair. You know, a lot of the things that happen to you, 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 you didn't even know about it and, and you did things right and you were misdiagnosed, but you push forward and you define the limits. It's like, okay, um, I can't get a gold medal in karate. Let me try sprinting. Okay, sprinting, I'm having these issues. Let me try rowing. Okay, rowing, um, I'm in the middle, some time away. 
this happens now, I have to rehabilitate, I can't just give up. Um, and, and you keep pushing. Now, um, I was reading that there was, a t there was a moment you were thinking of going into the 2016 Olympic uh, cycling games. And they, mm. I could be mistaken on that because I'm drawing that from my memory. But there was, um, I think you, you announced retirement once in 2014 or 15. And um, how was that for you that you were pushing? Because I also know that in 2006, you were aiming for some sort of um, gold medal as well. And, and there it became short. But this time, it's not because you couldn't do it physic, uh, physically, um, because you just couldn't do it. It was actually something that happened you didn't ask for. And you're like, okay, this is it. This is where I'm drawing the line. Mm. How was that for you? Yeah, so what what actually happened in 2015? I was I was re-diagnosed. So 2014, I had the surgery, got back on the bike, everything was going great. 2015, I was told in September 2015 that the tumors come back again. So this is the third time now. I was like, wow, okay, I'm going to make a push for Rio. It's only one more year, so I pushed for Rio, and then uh, in February of 2016, so we're in the Olympic year. Uh, the tumor grew again more and the surgeons were like, look, we, we, we don't, we're going to have to take this out. We don't have time uh, to, to go to the Rio. So this was three weeks before the world championships and I'd done all the training and I sat there and I was like, ah, man, you know, this is, this is pretty hard to take. You know, I've done all this work and something that I have no control over whatsoever is growing back again inside me. I can't see it. I look fit. I feel fit. I'm, I'm riding my bike, doing great times, but yet there's this, this growth inside me that literally no one knows why it's grown. I have no control over it, and it's come back again, and I have to make this decision of do I not have surgery and try and make the games, which is impossible, or do I go for the surgery? So obviously I, I went for the surgical option. Uh, I walked into surgery in, in March of 2016, uh, fully fit, no symptoms. I went through a 10-hour surgery. Uh, they cut me through the front of the neck. And I woke up in ICU, and, and I was paralyzed. It, was, it wasn't a 10 paralysis. I couldn't move, basically, from the neck down completely on one side of my body. So I had the right side, but the left side was, was, was completely dead. Um, and I remember lying there, and I panicked. I was like, and, I, and I was trying. And it was really interesting because of all the, the mindfulness training, all the martial arts training, all the way of trying to control the autonomic nervous system, the visualization, the reframing, all went out the window. I had been overtaken by complete shock. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't breathe. And then you know, the doctors were coming over like, trying to calm me down, trying to calm me down. And they kept saying, look, you're going to move. It's going to be fine. Uh, eight weeks later, I was still lying there and I hadn't moved. And then I started to think, wow, okay, this is life's going to be different now and things are going to really be a challenge. And that, that's really when, I guess, I, that's when I started to really become more in, interested in the academic side. I signed up to, to all of these courses, uh, Yale, Harvard, all these little short psychology courses, emotional intelligence courses, neuroscience courses, anything I could study to try and understand the mind and the body so I could basically make it work for me. So I thought, right, I need to, if I'm going to walk again, I, I need to work on this, but not just from one level. I need to come at it from a million different approaches. So I learned all about the neurobiology of the spinal cord, about the neuroanatomy of the brain, the neurochemistry, everything I needed to do. Um, I, I, was in, I was in hospital for six months. Uh, I was in a wheelchair. I, had to, I was getting bed baths uh, to do the toilet. I had to have people physically manually use their hands for me to have bowel movements. Uh, you know, I was constantly peeing, wet in the bed. Uh, I couldn't eat. And then I remember it was my birthday. It was the 21st of April and Noel had come down from Aviemore and my mum was there and I was in Stoke Mandeville, which is a spinal hospital. And I remember being in my wheelchair and I, I actually got out my wheelchair and I walked 10 meters and, and Noel, Noel got it on video and we sat down and I remember his words. He just went, progress and, and and for me you know the doctors and nurses and physios in there told me i'd never walk and here i was i'd managed to take 10 meters and that was that 
you know, that 10 meters was probably more, meant more to me than anything else. And then I thought, okay, I need, I need to get out of this hospital. So basically after being in for six months, I, I got myself out of hospital. I, I spent a month with a very good friend of mine, Dave Inham, who's an osteopath who helped rebuild me. And then I went into a private spinal rehabilitation hospital in London. And I spent another six months there trying to learn, trying to get the arm to move, trying to get the leg to move. And then halfway into the 2017, is when I, I guess if I was moving through the Kruber Ross stages of grief, I was trying to integrate again. I was trying to get back into society, but I had never really accepted what had happened to me. And I didn't realize I was about to have a huge crash. So as I tried to integrate into society, I'd lost my identity as an athlete. I was no longer an athlete. I, I was just this disabled person with a spinal cord injury. And this was a whole different world to me. And I remember just crashing just literally physically, emotionally, uh, cycle everything crashing to the point where I was like, I want to die. I don't want to live anymore. And that's when I stumbled across Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And I read that, that, that Nietzsche, the great professor, had said that to live is to suffer. If you can find meaning in suffering, then you can find purpose. And then we can live purposefully. And when I read that, I was like, I need to find a purpose. I need to find meaning in all of this. And for me, that was to get back on the bike. So I actually went back to sport after stepping away from it. And I got back on a bike. I raced in November of 2017 and I won a bronze medal. And it was a very small race. It was, there was no one really there, but that bronze medal meant more to me than any world championship medal, Olympic medal, Paralympic medal, anything because that was a representation of going from that bed in the hospital room. And when I was in hospital, I had like a goal setting meeting with the spinal hospital nurses and physios. And I was in my wheelchair and they said to me, what's your goal, David? And I said, well, I want to ride for Great Britain again. And I want to cycle 800 kilometers across the Alps. And they looked at me, looked at each other and they went, let's just try and brush your teeth. Because at that moment, I couldn't even brush my own teeth. And, and I looked around the room and I was sort of lying in a wheelchair with drool coming down my mouth, pea pots in my bed, you know, catheters. And I thought, no, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to cycle across the Alps. And they were so, they were like, there's no chance you're going to do this. And by having that go, I held on to that. And that got me through all of the rehabilitation, which was horrendous, times where I wanted to die. Uh, I'd lost this identity, but I found this meaning, this purpose again. And then in 2018, I, I, I rolled down the start gate of the World Championships in Italy in Maniago. And, and I raced for Great Britain at the World Championships to then finish the World Championships, to come home, to be diagnosed again. And I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, how can I, like, I, I remember saying after the Olympics in London, I could never go through this again. I'm like, I'm going to have to go through this again for the fourth time. This is, this is crazy. And I had one goal still left to do was to cycle across the Alps. So I, uh, I, I was waiting to go for surgery and I jumped on a plane. I flew to Geneva and in seven days, I cycled from Geneva to Monaco, which was just shy of 800 kilometers in seven days. And just before going, um, I, I knew that there was a chance that I might not live. Uh, with the tumor. So I, I found a guy who would take me. So I went over and met this guy, Marvin. We, we cycled across the Alps. I came back and my surgeon who paralyzed me, he retired after my surgery. So I had no surgeon at this point. So I come back to London after cycling across the Alps in 2018. I know I've got this tumor and I'm like, I need to find a surgeon. Like, how, like, where do you even start? So it's, it's kind of like going on Tinder looking for a surgeon. <laughs> so you're going to find this person who's going to cut you open to try and save your life. So I spoke to a few surgeons and they told me they couldn't do it. They were like, man, we, we can't do this. Probably remove it, but you're going to be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of your life on a breathing apparatus. I didn't want that. So I started to call America. So I spoke to doctors in Sloan Kettering, in the Mayo Clinic, Mount Syed, uh, MD Anderson. And they all basically, they gave me a lot of hope, but I'll never forget the surgeon in the Mayo Clinic said to me, can you send me a picture of you standing? So I sent him a photo on my bike and he says, no, David, I need a recent picture. I said, this is the most recent picture I have. And he's like, 
you're cycling? He said, I've got people, I've got people in the Mayo Clinic here who have tumors like this and they ain't even walking or standing. And I said, yeah, I'm cycling. And he's like, I have no idea how you're doing that. And I think a lot of that was probably to do with, with the mental strength and the resilience and having that purpose that just kept me, kept me going. You, you know, um, I know we're coming to the end of the podcast episode, but I just want you to, to, to notice, and, and it's, I don't think I, some guy, you know, a therapist here in Miami has to tell you anything, <laughs> but um, it's just your perspective of and perception of the way things happen to you a lot of people would revert backwards on every single one of these events and somehow you don't even you don't even think twice about it it's about the next moment or to keep pushing forward or to keep training or to keep and and you're so happy doing it and um, it's almost like it's almost like this perspective and this perception that you have about yourself about life in general and and, and almost striving for something more carries you in all these moments instead of reverting back. And, yeah. and man, it, it's, and, and when I look at your life, it's like this, David, boom, and then down moments and then up moments again. And, and the up moments, a lot of times are personal milestones that you met. And it's, it's truly amazing, David. And I just want to let you know, thank you so much, um, not only for being on this podcast, but being who you are. Um, pushing forward and creating a template for the world at large um, to, 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 to see, hey, um, if I get knocked down or this happens, look at David and, and what he's done and how many times he's gotten back up and look at you now after that. Yeah. Well, when I, you know, when I went back in in 2008 for my surgery in November, you know, they cut me open to the back of the neck here uh, twice. Actually, I had the surgery, then they had to take me back in and cut again. I spent two weeks in an ICU on breathing ventilators. I was having hallucinations. I couldn't walk. I couldn't move. Uh, you know, I came out of hospital. I, and when I came out of hospital, I put a bike at the end of my bed in my bedroom. And I was like, my goal is to get on that bike. I couldn't walk, couldn't stand. And I thought, even if I only gone for two minutes, it's a starting point. And it's heartbreaking to sort of go from being really fit to rock bottom, to really fit to rock bottom. And it has been this sort of roller coaster. But I thought, you know, th there's my bike, there's my purpose, there's my meaning, there's, okay, my, this is what I need to get on this bike. And within, again, a few, few weeks after surgery, I was back on my indoor bike and, and just turning away. Then I went through the radiation. Radiation was tough. And there was a few things in radiation that really, really resonated with me and I'd love to share is that when I went into the cancer ward, everyone was happy. Most people were happy. Most people were smiling and, 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 and experiencing. Then I'd leave the cancer ward and go up onto the main street and everyone was unhappy. And I was like, wow, you know, like people really need to understand that, you know, happiness really comes from within. It's about creating, you know, memories and savoring moments, acts of kindness. It's not about buying the next car or the next jacket to make you happy. That's, that's short lived. And, and this really resonated when I was in hospital because when, when you're in ICU and you're fighting for your life, it, it doesn't matter who you are. You're basically just, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're George Clooney in bed five. He's just pooed himself. Can someone go and clean him up? He's not George Clooney, the Hollywood actor. You know, at that point, you can't take your plasma TVs with you. You can't take your cars with you. You take memories. And, you know, memories are made from experiences. So I really quickly realized that actually life's about living. And I always say to myself, it's a bit of a, a stoatic sort of Marcus Aurelius approach of, you know, if this was the last day I was to live, what would I want to do? And I always sort of live that way, not, not with savings and stuff, but just with just engaging in, in things that really move me and get me into flow and make me feel alive. And, and I realized that in the cancer ward, that these people had all had this like diagnosis. And they're like, wow, you know, I, I'm going to be grateful for every single breath I take, every single bird in the sky or flower that grows a new flowering plant in your house. I'm grateful for everything. I notice like the level of awareness is growing rather than having this tunnel vision of going through life do 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 we you know i think i've become more human being than human doing where i was very human doing before now i'm more like a human being i want to savor these moments and for me that's about getting on my bike so i thought quickly bike at the end of the bed get onto it then get out riding mm -hmm. and then get back to the alps and ride my bike and cycle my bike that's where i'm most happy 
And for me, that's about creating, it's not about winning medals, it's about creating experiences and memories. So, and a lot of ways I see it as a gift what I've been through because I've seen the end of life. I've, you know, I've been there and there's, I know there's a lot of philosophers talk about, you know, if you're aware of your own mortality, then you might choose to live life differently today. If we expect to live for 20,000 years, then we become great procrastinators. But if we know, if we, if we have this finite time, then we make use of this time. time. Time, We don't get time back. You know, you can lose money. And I mean, I've lost body paralysis and everything, but I get it back. But the one thing we don't get back is time. And that's one thing I've learned living with the tumor and trying to live these two lives of being an athlete and patient, patient athlete is that the one thing I don't get back is time. And, and that's one thing I'm very, very aware about. So I want to invest my time in, in good things and good people, not toxic relationships. That's why I shrunk my group of social network down very small so I can invest in that time. So I'm getting energy from everybody. I don't want to be with people who are sapping me. I want to leave like our conversation. I'm buzzing. I've got lots of energy. I'm pumped for the day now. And that's the, that's the interactions I want to have. You got me buds for the day. And, uh, and, and honestly, that, that last part that you mentioned about how you went outside and, and everybody seemed so unhappy and, you know, we, everybody gets so caught up in this rat race, right? In this race for I want this, I want that, that person has this, but I don't have it. So let me go out and get it. And what, and, and I'm, but it's not about that. It's about the moments that you create. And I saw that you reposted our content today of, how sometimes it seems like something happens and it's the end of the world. But then um, really when you look back on it and some time passes, it was just an unpleasant moment and you gain so much from it. And um, I'm not sure if that's, you know, I'm obviously using that analogy, but that's what you're talking about essentially that all these surgeries that happened, they almost brightened up your consciousness every time. And, and they help you now experience every moment. Like it's your last David. And yeah. um, I'm going to take this with me today and for the weeks and for the months. And thank you so much, man. Um, is there any last words you want to share with the audience, uh, David? I mean, you've given so much insight. And to me, you're a real life Iron Man, you know? I'm yeah. not sure what the term or what it is, but Iron yeah. Man. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just so grateful. I found, found your, your website, your, your posts. They've, they've been a huge inspiration to me. I'm massively passionate about psychology and about the mental performance side of things. I, you know, I, I try to live where my feet are every day. And I try to say that to people. And, you know, just, you know, you know, don't compare yourself to other people. Try and be the best person that you are. Try and be a better person tomorrow than you were today. And, you know, every morning I get up, I do a little routine. And I put my feet on the floor and, the, and I smile. And, and I always make sure that every morning when I put my feet on the floor, I say that one thing I'm grateful for, and then I smile. And just that little thing sets me up for the whole day. And, and it's just, yeah, you know, be kind to yourself. I always say that, you know, as human beings, we're very judgmental. We judge ourselves, we judge others. And I try to say to people, you know, come from a place of compassion, you know, and really be compassionate for yourself and for others and, and just try and be a nice person. And, and you know, for me, it's, it, yeah okay you know if you have one olympic medal does it make you happy not really you have two does it make you happy not really if you have 10 does it make you any happier not really you see a lot of michael phelps really struggled and he's got 20 of them and um, you know that real happiness comes comes from within and, and really living in the moment and being present and i just always try to say to people to you know to live where your feet are you know don't 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 try and live ahead of time because we don't own tomorrow and and i i live every three months from scans to scan and, you know, I've always got that oncology cloud hanging above me. And I just think every morning, you know, I'm going to live where my feet are today and I'm going to go out and just, just smash it and, and, you know, enjoy life. You know, we're, we're here, we're here once, you know, we got, we got it. No, you know, don't get caught up in all this, this stuff that's just noise, turn the noise down, you know, tune into to stuff, you know, and, that, and that's why I follow, that's why I follow your account, Jan, because it's, it's all positive and then it's learning, you know, people, you're learning the, the stuff you put out is you know, the stuff that you put out, everyone in the world should be reading that um, uh, because that, that's really given positive change. Ted, thank you so much. And just so you know, this um, podcast will be have a clip on the Instagram. It will go up on YouTube and on Spotify. And hopefully um, you, by you being on this podcast, can make a difference in other people's lives. You already have. So. 
and uh, you already have. And uh, I thank you so much, David. And thank you to all the audience out there for listening. Um, I hope you guys take David's final words and take him with you throughout your day and through your journey of life. And um, thanks again, David. Okay. And uh, God bless you. Um, you know, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, the man with the bearded. <laughs> May you be blessed. Okay. Yeah. yeah everyone be blessed. Thank you. Guys. No problem.